A lot of people do the same thing though with cursed objects. And a lot of times it's ignorance and sometimes it's just stinking bullheadedness. There are many people I know of who have been enlightened about the truth about some of these, the dangers of these things and how God hates these abominable things. And yet they say, well, I don't care. I like it. Okay, you're playing Russian roulette. And one of these days you can blow yourself and your whole family into all kinds of trouble. Let's look at some scripture to begin with. In Leviticus 17.7. Leviticus 17.7. Please jot these down because we may be moving along faster than you can turn to them. <clears throat> but I would like you to have the scriptures. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils or unto demons, after whom they have gone a whoring. And in Deuteronomy 32.17, they sacrificed unto devils or demons, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. That's Deuteronomy 32.17. Most people are unaware of the dangerous things they have in their home. Now Satan is a legal expert. I hope you've gained that understanding thus far in the workshop. It's been touched on a number of times. Satan is a legal expert and you give him just a legal grounds or some of your ancestors give him legal grounds he will attack and continue to attack and you can faith walk him all you want to but he won't leave and his demons will not give up they may go underground they may plow in deeper and they may hide for a season but they're just bluffing because they really are not afraid of you and as long as he has legal grounds or legal rights he will attack I heard somebody some months ago on TV saying the devil, I'm tired of hearing people talk about the devil having legal rights. He has no rights at all. I thought to myself, you have no Bible knowledge at all either if you make a foolish statement like that because that is not scriptural. There are definite spiritual laws in effect and whether people like them or not, whether they agree with them or not, whether they think they're fair or unfair, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. We are subject to the spiritual laws of the universe and God the just righteous holy God set them in motion and so just back your little tiny brain into a corner and realize that even though you can't figure out now why God wanted to do it this way and I don't know why he gets so upset about this well quit worrying about why he does just accept the fact that there's some things he gets upset about and you and I would do well to simply uh, clear ourselves and get ourselves in a position where we're not in the line of fire. If we open up to the enemy, he will attack. If our ancestors open up to the enemy, he will attack. But there are definite ways in which we can get free. But if you are too lazy, too stupid, too proud to take advantage of what God has given to you in salvation through Jesus Christ and the resurrection victory, then you won't have victory. I don't care how much you walk in victory. You're not walking in victory until you're able to put your foot on the neck of the enemy and cause them to be defeated and your life to be changed. Now some people just get a, a speaking acquaintance with deliverance and they run off in all directions thinking they're suddenly experts. Well maybe they are if you define expert right. I've heard that an expert is a little spurred away from home. And uh, if you define it that way, maybe they are experts. And, but I don't know any experts in deliverance. I know some people who know a little bit about deliverance, who have found some practical ways to attack the demonic problems that have afflicted us as believers. And as you move into deliverance, of course, you have these poor hand-wringing brigade. The brigade meets you at the gate, wringing their hands and weeping and saying, Oh, you just talk about Satan and the demons. You just glorify and lift up Satan. And we just glorify Jesus. And we glorify you, Lord. And those religious spirits are just wallowing in that religious syrup. You don't glorify Jesus just because you say you are. You glorify Jesus by being obedient to what he said. And it's his idea to conquer the enemy in his name. 
And as you move deeper in deliverance, you will not glorify Satan. If you begin to glorify Satan, it's because you missed deliverance a country mile. You're off into some other pasture. You're, you're eating some off somebody else's table, not the Lord. Because the deeper you move into real, genuine, devil-frightening, demon-chasing deliverance, the more you're going to fall in love with Jesus. And the more you're going to fall in reverential old back before our mighty God and say, my God in heaven, how did you ever get anything done? When you begin to see the mess that we are in, the utter disaster of the occupied territory in our minds, wills, emotions, and bodies, and how God manages to do anything is a miracle upon miracle. And yet he has slapped the living hound out of the devil with imperfect men and women down through the ages. And in this final wind-up of the end times, as we're moving into the end times, I believe, full speed, God is pouring out deliverance on a massive scale to those who will receive it. Now, since not many are receiving it, those who are receiving are going to get a real charge. So hang on. If you hang in there, you'll get it because God is looking for willing vessels. So don't give up where you are. I don't care. Nobody accepts deliverance. If you know it's real, stick by your guns and pray and draw a circle around yourself. And say, okay, Lord, I don't have anybody else to pray for. Let's go to work on me. And that'll take you quite a while. Because about the time you get started on yourself, next thing you know, somebody, the Lord will send somebody in to you. Don't worry about it. When you're really ready, God will start sending people to you. I've never seen it fail that when workers were ready themselves, they were not completely delivered. We do not issue certificates saying, you have now completed the workshop. You are three quarters delivered now. Only one more quarter to go and $5,000 and we'll have you, we'll pronounce you, we'll give you a paper certifying that you are now a demon destroyer. Oh my. But there are things that we can give grounds to the enemy by just fooling around and missing the plain truth of Scripture. As I said, I've got a, a booklet coming out, hopefully in the near future, and one of the articles in it are, Beware the Vultures are Coming. And I'm talking about religious vultures. They're after every deliverance person and every deliverance work. They want to infiltrate, water down, and kill off every deliverance work. If they can't stop it dead in its tracks, they want to water it down, adulterate it, bring in inner, inner healing, or some other foolishness. In the book room, we have some printouts of Dave Hunt's latest update on seduction, and you will be amazed because he names names of the people who are opposing and what they're saying and what they do say. And even you can find out that Mr. Copeland says that you can get your, your animals saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I knew he'd gone a long way, but I didn't know he'd gone that far. I tell you people, we're living in days of deep darkness. Deep darkness. Now, in 1 John 5, 21, we're going to go rapidly through some scriptures to get some background, and then we're going to tear into some sacred cows and butcher a whole herd. So buckle your seatbelts, honey, because we're going to probably visit you before it's over. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The word idol is the word from which we get doll. We'll have more to say about that a little bit later. Joshua 6, 18, and also Joshua 7, 11 and 12. Joshua 6, 18, and also Joshua 7, 11 and 12. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. A cursed thing is something that God curses, something that God hates, something that God pronounces unclean an abomination not to be touched or to be fooled with at all. And make the camp of Israel a curse. He said, if you don't keep yourself from the accursed thing, you'll make the whole camp, you'll pollute the whole camp of Israel and trouble it. 
They have also transgressed my covenant, for they have taken the accursed thing. Therefore, Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Why? Because they took the accursed thing. And many believers today have taken accursed things into their homes, into their lives, and as a consequence, they are cursed. And everything they do is cursed, and they turn their backs to their enemies, which means they, when you turn your back, you're running. When you're fighting, you're face to face. And the reason Christians are being defeated on a massive scale uh, in many cases is because of these accursed things that are hidden in our homes. Satan has managed to put it, put it by on us. And some of them are there because of ignorance. Others are there because of pure, unadulterated stubbornness. And I remember that stubbornness is equated with iniquity. When Samuel reamed out Saul, he said, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity. And God hates both, all of that. And if you're going to be stubborn, don't. Uh, if you've got a stubborn spirit, you better ask God about it. Uh, you heard Rob talk about Behemoth, and I think he hit the nail on the head. Behemoth proposes to speak for God. And he's a liar because he's twisting everything in every direction but the right one and attacks the people who are really walking with Jesus. That's why the attacks on real deliverance people. If you're not in real deliverance, you have great success. But if you get into real deliverance, everybody in his dogs hates you because behemoth rises up to speak for God. I'll tell you, I wouldn't go to that church because if you get a tag wish, you'll get something in you that's really bad. Yes, to defeat the devil is very bad in a lot of people's eyes. Get your life cleaned up. Quit giving your money away to religious shysters. In some people's minds, it's a very bad thing. But in Jesus' eyes, it's pleasing. Now, you can force, you can cause yourself, if you're being continually defeated in your Christian life, go looking for accursed objects. You're playing Russian roulette, keeping these things around your house. It's not worth it the trouble. You, you'd better switch rather than fight. And I'd throw them out. Proverbs 28 and 9, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. If you turn away from God's word, then your prayer becomes an abomination. And you can pray all day long. You can fast and pray until you're just weeping before the Lord. And if you turn away from God's law, you're, you are heaping abominations before God. It's like taking buckets of sewage and dumping it out on the pearly white, uh, at the pearly white city and dumping it on the throne of God and say, here, I'm offering this to you, God. He says, I don't want it. We don't have that kind of garbage up here. It's an abomination. Even your prayer becomes an abomination if you're not willing and obedient. Now, in Psalm 106, 34 through 37 Psalm 106 34 through 37 they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works we are mingled among the heathen people it's hard not to learn their works at work in our neighborhood in the advertising TV movies everything everywhere the heathens works are manifest and it's very easy to get mingled in with their works and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. An idol is something that comes before you and God. It can be a physical thing that you can see. It can be a spiritual quality or something that, uh, a characteristic that you admire more than you admire being belonging to God. Yea, they sacrifice their sons and daughters to demons. When you do this, you are opening the door for headlong attack by the demons on your children. Your family is laid wide open by your own disobedience. Judges 17, 6. People say, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. And that's the way they do it. They say, I don't see anything wrong with it. Do you? You say, well, open your eyes, idiot. You've got eyes. And that's why people don't see. They don't look. If they look, they don't look in the right place. They don't look in God's Word. They don't look to the Lord. And besides, most of the time, 
That is simply a cover-up saying, well, I don't really want to change, so the best thing to say is I don't understand, I don't like that preacher. Of course, that gives me an excuse to do everything in my, that was right in my own eyes. In Judges 17, 6, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You start doing that, it brings the judgment of God on people and on nations. And that's what we've got in our nation today. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. All the talk shows on TV are advocating. The magazine articles, the newspapers are advocating, do what you think is right. Of course, they've thrown away the rule book. God gave us the rule book, but that's, that's passe. We don't go by that. We'll look into the Hindu mystical formulas. We'll look into the Tibetan lamas. We'll look into some demon-ridden society that's produced nothing but poverty, hell on earth, where everybody is touched. And to them, we shall go for great wisdom and be utterly deceived. They did what was right in their own eyes. But God, uh, Luke 16, 15, but God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Mark it down that just because the world goes after it with all their heart is probably a good sign you need to leave it out. You and I need to drop it. Get away from it. Cease, desist. Stop. Why? Because it's an, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Now, Proverbs 26.2. Proverbs 26, 2. So the curse, causeless, shall not come. There's always a reason when the curse is coming. If you have a curse that's from God, it came because of something you or your ancestors got involved in that was forbidden. You say, well, I don't see how God can hold me accountable because I wasn't even around when my ancestors got all messed up. And I just can't help it. And I just feel so sorry for myself, and I don't know why preachers just try to whip us over the head with that. I can't help what my grandma and grandpa did. No, you can't. You can't help what they did, but you can change for yourself and for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. You can give them a better start than you had. Because God in our generation is pouring out the message of power, the message of deliverance and overcoming. Binding and loosing is going forth in the earth to cripple and disable the works of Satan that have been able to fasten onto the body of Christ and cripple it and paralyze it. And there's a great outpouring of evil all over the earth. The New Age movement is sweeping and the amalgamation of the nations, everything is going down the tube rapidly. And the evil is pouring out witchcraft and the occult coming through every channel to grab everybody. But God, where, wherever their sin abounds, there does grace much more abound. And so God, to counteract this flood of evil, is pouring out a fresh revelation, an understanding of the scriptures concerning deliverance from demons, concerning binding evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God. He is, he is pouring out the knowledge of, and the encouragement on his people, no matter if they be one, two, a dozen, five hundred, it doesn't make any difference that they can bind evil spirits and they can loose the spirits of God to go into the heavenlies and tear up the devil's plans and reverse them for the glory of Jesus Christ. And those who are on earth who are being tools in his hands will never take glory to themselves. They'll give glory to the Lord of glory who has made it all possible by his sinless life, by his matchless death, by his glorious resurrection, and by his soon coming. Hallelujah. This is what I learned while I was out to pasture. I knew it all the time, but it just got stoked up a little bit. I feel good. Put a longer tape on back there, boy. <laughs> we must understand that we give grounds to these wicked ones, and God is pouring out his power to rescue and deliver his bound people, to loose part of the church and let her go like a scourge across the earth against the forces of the evil one, breaking the shackles and setting the captives free. And everywhere the people are crying, help us, help us. And the preachers are saying, not this way, not that kind. 
Well, I'm sorry, we're going to have to just go right on past them and spread the table and say, come and dine, come and dine. Oh, listen, nine out of ten may never turn around and come back and say thank you, but the one who comes back and says thank you and walks and stays by their stuff is worth 2,000 that walked away. When you come to Hagwish, you see men standing in this pulpit who came here and stayed, who came here as teenage kids, some of them, and who have stayed here and have grown in grace and knowledge of God. They've never been to a Bible school. They don't know much theology, but they got a lot of theology. And they study the Bible. And they love the Word of God. And they hate the works of the darkness. And they are, have a oneness of heart and soul because they w believe that our mission is to share this glorious freedom message of liberation from the enemy in our generation. You say, well, supposing we fail, well, supposing we do. If we release hundreds and thousands before we fail, so what? The ones that are free will glorify Jesus for good for all of eternity about it. Amen? Quit worrying about the results. You're, you're taking the old viewpoint of the world. Who cares? We don't have scoreboards here because it doesn't matter how many people are here. It matters about the dedication and the love of Jesus that is poured out into the lives that are here. You know, there has come many times in our experience and other deliverance people have reported across the country that many times healing occurs when a cursed object has been removed or destroyed from the home. Healing that had been long sought after and people travel hundreds of miles to get to somebody who could heal and nothing happened. Maybe there was a temporary help, but nothing permanent and a cursed object located in the home and destroyed in Jesus' name, produced that which nothing else could do because it was an abomination. There are personal problems which cease when you renounce certain associations and you cut yourself loose from cursed objects and get rid of them out of your life. Some personality defects have been known to leave when seasonal or special observances were discontinued. Uh-oh, I felt somebody flinch. You're right, here comes Santa Claus. The Easter Bunny is hopping. Old Lady Luck is out. Listen, around here, we buried Old Lady Luck right after we barbecued the Easter Bunny. And right after we killed off Santa Claus. Listen, friend, don't get involved in these things. People go crazy. Why? Because the world is going crazy. And they spend themselves into debt and they'll pay for three to six months trying to get out of debt for a bunch of garbage they bought at Christmas. And for the first time in their life, they'll get up before daybreak to run to an Easter sunrise service, which is a pagan celebration. They don't go to Easter egg hunts because they're so pretty. That too came from the demons. Listen, every, if you want to celebrate Easter, if you want to celebrate the resurrection, try the first day of the week because on the first day of the week he came forth out of the tomb. Hallelujah. Every Sunday is Easter. You say, well, I don't want to hunt eggs every Sunday. <laughs> well, just throw your baskets away and teach your children to zero in on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And let your children know that's a pagan observance. And others don't know this, so don't feel harshly toward them because they don't know the difference. But we are trying to follow Jesus and we won't know abominable things. Tell you something else. Some of you go absolutely berserk over a birthday. Now, there's nothing wrong with you observing a birthday. But I know some people, they'll be bent out of joint for three months. They didn't send me a card. <laughs> and then that same woman, because usually it's the woman, because the men don't usually give a flip. But it's usually a, a, you dear gals, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on to you about it. Because it's usually you. i got something saved for the men back. i got a choice one for them coming up. I try to distribute the favors equally. Uh, 
But you gals, you know, you you mope around because nobody remembered my birthday. And then you get mad when somebody says, Well, how old are you, sister? You look like you're old as a hell. I'm 38 going on 39, and you look 65. Come on. Haven't we carried this just a little bit too far? Of course, you come to this church, you know that I'm a, I'm a bear cat on this sort of thing. You know, people, they, and they make so much, you know, did you ever see somebody make such a to-do about wrapping presents? They'll spend more on wrapping paper and ribbons than they did on the presents. I tell people, don't bother. Put it in a brown paper sack and hand it to me because I'm going to take it out of there anyhow. I'm not going to look at the paper. I'm going to toss it to the garbage. Of course, you're real smart. You gather up the paper and use it again. You know? Of course, wrapping paper people don't like that. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you being nice and courteous and remembering somebody's birthday. Don't, make, don't think I want to have you around here with high collars and long skirts and looking like this all the time. There's nothing wrong with having fun about things, but don't get all bent out of shape about it. Don't let it carry you away. It becomes an idol. I mean, if the world will not come to an end, if you don't have a birthday cake, you probably do better. You might lose some weight. You say, how do you know? None of your business. We've gotten carried away with too many observances. The churches, oh my lamb, Lent is coming. Well, the only Lent we've got around our place comes out of our dryer. And we throw it away. And I think that'd be a good thing to do with Lent. And the religious thing, just throw it away. You have the Lenten observance. And then you have the special Sunday for this. And the special Sunday service, and a special service. We have our evangelistic service on Sunday morning because that's the time everybody comes. Sunday night, we have our stewardship program to raise money for the budget because we have to pay the notes on the building and the light bills are really piling up. And on Wednesday night, the midweek service, we have deliverance and we hope nobody will hear it because how shameful if it leaked out that we had deliverance I got a bulletin from somebody in the mail and they said we're having worship services on Sunday a Bible study during the week and on Friday night we have a deliverance service and then it went on paragraph 2 and said our Friday night services are really growing I thought yes you fool that's the thing the people need they're growing they're coming to the deliverance service why don't you pour it in that worship and praise service and give them something to praise God about? Oh, it would mess up our worship. Well, any service that demons breaking out in could mess up needs messing. It needs to be smeared. Oh, dear. I'm behind schedule. I've got to pick up speed. You people are just too easy to preach to. Shame on you. you got a preacher steamed up and he can't cut off. And my son-in-law is really going to get me about that. All right. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, protect, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us cleanse ourselves of all this filthiness of the flesh, everything that's coming in from the world. Let's ferret it out. Let's hunt it out. You know, sometimes people say, well, is this wrong? Is that wrong? I always think of an illustration I heard many years ago. When I was a very young Christian, I heard a preacher get up and say, sometimes people are asking me, is this wrong? Is this right? Is this, is this wrong to do this or not to do that? And I say, you know, if a young man calls his mother and said, Mama, is this shirt dirty? And she said, yes. He said, but you didn't look at it. She, he said, if you need to ask, it's dirty. You know, something clean, you can tell it, can't you? If you don't believe it, take a whip. If you nearly pass out, it's dirty. It needs cleaning. And we need to sniff around our houses and our, our, our own personal lives and find these 
filthy things that the devil has hidden away. Now in Deuteronomy 7.26, Deuteronomy 7.26, and really mark this one, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it, lest you become just like that thing that God hates, that he has put a curse upon, because it's associated with witchcraft, because it's associated with darkness, because in God's mind, it's evil. I didn't say in your mind, I said in God's mind. You have to remember, your mind's been tampered with. My mind's been tampered with. That's why we need the Word of God to straighten us out and show us what God thinks, not what we think or hope. All right, that's Deuteronomy 7, 26. Idols are representations of something. They can be a mental image. They can be an object. In uh, many places, food is offered to idols. Candles are burned to idols. But you can do away with the images and still be an idolatry. There's some of you who worship a little old piece of paper. It's green on one side and gray on the other. It used to have Washington's picture on it, but you like Franklin's better. Now, don't look, don't look so innocent. You know George Washington's only one dollar and Franklin's on the hundred. But a lot of people worship. And America has made that dollar bill its God. They have spent us into poverty trying to buy friends by dumping millions across the... I heard President Bush on the news the other day in Poland. I hope he comes home before he gives away the store. Every time you hear, he's giving away something else. He was, he was standing up and very straight-faced. He's saying, I'm in the historic city of Krakow. And bless their heart, acid rain is eating away these historic buildings and landmarks here. And I am, I am going to pledge that we will send $15 million to restore this historical city. I said, George, you've got to be out of your cotton-picking mind. $15 million? Let the buildings fall down if the people don't want to keep them up. I'm not interested. Float those $15 million to our farmers who are being closed out of their homes and out of their livelihood. Float that $15 million in any one of a million places over in this country. So our people can benefit from it. That's going to come out of your pockets, friend. That's going to be out of the next tax increase. They don't make that out of air, you know. They make it out of your chase paycheck. And then he went on further. He was over there. And the leader of the Solidarity Movement was not contented. He said, I want you to advance us $5 billion. I mean, you know, if you want to ask, ask lots. Five billion dollars to help communist countries continue? Oh, they're getting away from communism. Oh, please. Surely you don't believe that. I don't even think our leaders are that stupid. We are financing our own destruction, Lenin said a long time ago. We will have a great peace offensive. We will offer peace to the West. And the capitalist countries will rush and offer. They'll load us with money because they'll be so excited about having peace. Does that sound familiar? They'll rush to us and offer us anything we want because, and then we will uh, we'll take all of that and get ready for the Sunday punch. They never change. The communists have not changed at all. Did you see what they did in China? They let that thing go on long enough to let all the leaders come out in the open and then they grabbed them. That's typical communist tell you. Anybody that knows what communism is like, that wasn't any surprise. The communists said, we can't believe it. I thought, what's the matter? Where have you been? They did it in, in Red China. They did it in Cambodia. They did it in uh, Vietnam. They have done it in Cuba. They did it everywhere. The communists don't change. They operate the same way all the time. Where is their man? Their minds are on vacation. But that was Mike's subject. I will stay off of that one. Idols must be put away, whether they're in your mind or whether they're little objects. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 through 22, 
But I say that the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Do I provoke, we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than him? So do you actually think you can get away with this? Doing the forbidden thing? Acts 17, 29. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. You're not going to find God in the works of men's hands. Whether it's buildings, whether it's little statues that sit on your dashboard, hang around your neck, or whatever. If you want to know about things that hang around your neck, I suggest you get the devil and Karen Kingston. Find out what happened to a blessed crucifix. It is hilarious, and I'm not going to tell you. But it's in the book. It's documentary. Now, in Genesis 35, 2 and 4, then Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. And look what they did when they put away their strange gods. Look how what a strange reaction. They gave unto J Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. Uh-oh, ladies. Brace yourselves. And any men who have their tears. Exodus 21, 6. His master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. It was a sign of slavery, voluntary slavery. They didn't throw you down and hold you and punch holes in your ears, dear friend. You submitted to it. It's a mark of slavery, okay? So when you see some guy with the dingle dangles hanging, and you know, when they sling their head, I really am worried they'll knock their eyeballs out. You know, some of those things are so long, if you sling it, if you got going good, the, the centripetal force would almost jerk a knot in your head. Uh, you know, it might, might put you a knot in your neck, and certainly it might slap you in the eye. It's dangerous. They're also the marks of harlotry. When you see overdone jewelry, overdone makeup, you know where they put on like a putty knife, like uh, Tammy? By the way, guys, you can't cover those cracks. They just won't. Now, the road, the, the, the highway department can cover theirs. But, honey, it won't work with you. I don't care what Mary Kay says. She's getting old, too. And pretty soon she's going to have to wear a false face because I looked at her the other day and I thought, Sister, it's not working for you either. Bless your heart. You're trying your hard to cover it up, but it's not... The more you put on, the more it emphasizes those wrinkles. Just throw back and release, and just clean up and look nice. You say, well, you don't believe in any makeup? I didn't say that. Some old barns need a little touch-up. But, I mean, some need all the help they can get. But when it looks like, when it looks like you've been eating blood, and when it looks like you've got the trowel out when you put her on, and when you smile, you can hardly smile because it feels like you, and everybody looks at you and thinks, oops, it's going to fall off, sure, shoot. Sure. And the little kids gather around you to see if it's going to flake, you know. You got too much on, okay? No, seriously. When, when it's overdone, it's a sign of harlotry. I didn't say the woman's a harlot. You can pick up a spirit of harlotry modeling after a lot of these models, a lot of these advertisements are made by moral lepers. They look pretty, but they're rotten inside. And if you pattern after them, now there are, there are companies that have you think that if you brush with their toothbrush, with their toothpaste, those boys are going to just swarm around you just smiling, just going, <laughs> you know? Gals, don't you believe they lying? You say, I know it, I tried it and it worked. Isn't it funny how we're so easily deceived? Don't believe everything like that. Stay with me and say, oh, mercy. 
uh, the earrings. Let's go after them again. Judges 8, 26. People say, that. well, why are earrings wrong? Here you go. Gideon says, give me the earrings of his prey. Well, they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites, heathen. In Hosea 2.13, And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to thee, and she decked herself and her, with her earrings and jewels, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. Harlotry. Harlotry, slavery, and heathenism. Are, that's what God looks at when he sees those ear dangles. Well, I'm not going to get rid of mine. Help yourself. Bell's palsy. Female problem. You say, I haven't got any. You will have. It's coming. Those are all related. And it's all started. Why do you have to turn your back on your enemy? Why are you defeated? Stubbornness. Refusal to listen to what God says. You say, well, I like them. Well, pigs like slop too, but you know, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. I don't want a bucket full just because hogs like it, do you? Do you want to be associated with that? I mean, do you want to please God or not? I'm just saying, you say, well, are you going to get mad at me because I don't take them out? Nope. My job is to tell you about it, and then it's up to you. The bear's on your back. It can claw you all at once. It's not bothering me. I haven't got a hold of mine yet. I'm not worried about that. I've got other areas I need to tend to, but that's one I don't have to worry with. Now, you say, well, why is this so wrong? Here's another one, Leviticus 21.5. They shall make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. Mutilation of the flesh. Just like your tattoos, fellas, you're looking so contented there. You'll belch feather on that one. Same category. Before Jacob could go to Bethel, the house of God, the idols, including those earrings, had to be put away. That's Genesis 35, 1 through 4. Some jewelry is made by people directly involved in witchcraft. Sarah's coven. Sarah Coventry? Yep. Earrings. Servitude when they're made with pierced ears. And I've already given you some scriptures on that. I want to skip on down. And uh, earring, pierced earrings have been found to be the root in some cases, not everybody, but in some cases of acne, female problems, Bell's palsy, hearing problems, and other illnesses have been directly connected. The demons gained their legal right to be there because of those stinking pierced ears. Rings can represent very strong bondage. Be careful who gives you a ring and where it comes from. Family heirlooms can be very dangerous if they're loaded with curses. So from people that have been in witchcraft, familiar spirits travel in those things. Some workers reported a lady that had a, uh, I'm not going to say this right, uh, Nafraturdi, that, that Egyptian queen, whatever her name was. Guess what she had? She had this necklace, one of those Egyptian necklaces. That was giving grounds to nephritis, infection of the kidneys. She did not get healed until she got rid of that necklace. When they destroyed that thing, removed it and destroyed it, she was instantly healed. And if right, no more problem. Necklaces, you better watch out. The neck sometimes is, represents the will and it can become a spiritual yoke. Not in every case. Chains always speak of bondage. Be careful of chains. Not always. See, you're not, everybody's not equally susceptible. I'm mentioning things for you to look at and pray about. You find out what the Father tells you. Bracelets, you know, they hold the wrist, don't they? Did you ever hear of shackles, handcuffs on the wrist? Be careful of what you put on your wrist. I'm not saying all of them are bad. Just you pray and see if God, uh, the devil's walk running. You better be careful of all, all turquoise things. Much of it is made by Indians. And in the designs, there are many times curses woven into Indian designs. And American Indian witchcraft is some of the strongest in the world. And it's woven into the designs and the little curly cues and the little geometric patterns many times. And it can bring sickness and a lot of other bondage. I said it can. Now, it doesn't necessarily do it. You say, well, I went and didn't bother me. Well, you first place you don't know. Because some things operating in you that haven't let you know where they are yet. Second place, even if it doesn't, it has been dangerous to some some of it's just not worth fooling with it. Be careful of Christian jewelry. Crucifixes are especially bad. 
Jesus is not on the cross. Where is he? At the right hand of the Father, resurrected, glorified, and ready to come again. He's not hanging on a cross. Crucifix is an insult. He's not there. He's risen. And do you need a cross to identify you as a Christian? You're a mighty sorry one if you do. I tell you, I just don't make much of all these little dingle dangles that people are getting around. Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. Thou shalt not make unto uh, thee any graven image or any likeness that is in the heaven above and the earth beneath that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. You better be careful about all these things, likenesses. Be careful. Dolls and stuffed animals are especially dangerous. Dolls have been known. We've known people here and other places in deliverance. Dolls have moved. They have talked. And they have been the source of curses. This little old doll, you know, I can never think of the name of it. Onion patch, cabbage patch, okay. I can always, I can always identify it because it, it's the one that looks like a horse stepping in the face. And why anybody would want that thing that looks like a, a mashed cow pie in their house, I can't imagine. But, you know, they fought over the thing. And they're still doing it. Those things are definitely demonic. I know of one case. Deliverance workers, uh, somebody came to visit them and brought one of those things in the house. They didn't like it, but because the little girl was, was not theirs and she was very uh, abused, and she was going to stay there a couple of days, they, they allowed it. In the middle of the night, the man of the house woke up. He was upstairs in the bedroom. He got up. He felt uneasy. He felt like something evil was in the house. He got up and he went. And there was that stinking cabbage patch doll levitating over the stairs. I can tell you about the Portuguese doll. That a lady, when she read Annihilating the Host of Hell, with testimonies of dolls in it, what happened to people with dolls. Uh, she got so mad, she threw that she'd got to read it, and she'd throw it across the room, and said that blank and blank, when Whirly's not going to tell me what to do. And then ugly words would come out of her mouth. And she's a Christian lady who'd had a lot of deliverance. And her husband said, well, what are you getting so mad about? Shut up, I don't want to talk about it. He's wrong. He's just being legalistic. He's being pharisaical. How dare he put that in there? And then she'd take the book in the car they'd be riding. And he said he should almost, she'd start beating him with the book. She'd get the man. And he finally told her, said, Connie, for goodness sake, if you get this upset about it, are you real, do you realize you're manifesting? And then she got famous. When she finally said, I can't do it. You take it out and throw it out. A little doll, been in the family for, oh, let's see, it was her grandmother. Her grandmother gave it to her mother, and she gave it to her. From Portugal, just a little China doll, dumb thing. And she didn't play with it. It was just sitting on a shelf. She hardly ever thought about it. But when he took it out to the garbage, he took a hammer and broke it all to pieces. And then he came back in looking funny. She said, what happened out there? She said, that, he said, the thing talked to me. Now, this is a great big man, tall as I am, and he's not, he's not given to seeing and hearing things. He's in deliverance. And she said, it did. What did it say? It said, please don't, please don't destroy me. I promise I won't come out every night and torment your wife like I've been doing for years anymore. If you'll just please let me stay. Well, he took the hammer and he really whacked her. <laughs> and not his wife, but Dom. <laughs> and <laughs> so anyway, these things happen, people. We've had Barbie dolls that cried because the little girl was getting rid of them. In New York, one time, Dr. Haggard and I were there in a meeting, and I mentioned uh, that night I'd spoken on dolls and how dangerous they could be. And I didn't know there was an elderly couple there that collected antique dolls. They had an attic full of boxes of dolls. And they both got convicted. They went home, and they, decided they wouldn't wait. They got home about midnight. And they went up and he said, well, she said, go up and dig those things out tonight. We're going to get rid of them tonight. We're going to break them up tonight. And, and he went up in the attic and here were boxes and boxes of antique dolls. And they were all crying. <laughs> that attic was full of weeping that he could hear. The dolls all started crying. They knew what was coming. You know, they talk about Mary crying. Those statues they call Mary. Mary's crying. You know why she's crying? Because that damnable idol knows what's coming. It's not Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's Simeon and her judgment is coming in Jesus' name. Well, furniture and boxes, be careful. Those with 
uh, dragon tire rings and things of this sort. Be careful. Why would you want an ugly thing like that around anyway? Imported box, uh, baskets and rugs have sometimes been tied together with a little, with prayer knots from some heathen. Remember when the children of Israel went into the land, God gave them cunning skills to build the things of the tabernacle? The devil gives cunning skills to his workmen. Everything in the island of Bali is dedicated to, to the demon. And boy, I'm really running short on this one. Toys that represent personalities, master of the universe. Those garbage things. They're all into witchcraft, ungodly stuff. And your kids, it can cause bedwetting. We've had all kinds of stories about bedwetting. The man here, that they had trouble with their son until they got rid of all his stuffed animals. And uh, by the way, I didn't tell him to do it. The Lord did. And he reported, and we said, well, amen. Praise the Lord. The trouble stopped. Evidently, there's something wrong with it. In Acts 19, 18 and 19, this is probably what we need to have. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also that used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all. And they counted the price of them and found that it was 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. If we want the word of God to prevail, a book burning, getting rid of these trash out of our homes will help. Be careful of a lot of these things. There are books and written material that are bad. There are records, rock and roll records, will cause all kinds of things. There was a young man here in this church uh, some years ago, and he was having dirty dreams every night. He was trying his best to walk straight, and every night had these filthy, horrible dreams that just tore him all up, and he was so embarrassed and so upset, and he came and said, Pastor, what did I do? And as I was talking to him, the Lord told me, and I said, Son, do you have any rock and roll records? He looked kind of funny. He said, yes. I said, where are they? He said, well, they used to be up on the shelf in my closet. But after I got convicted, I said, I don't listen to them anymore. After I came here, I got convicted of it. And I put them under my bed so nobody would know that I had them, that nobody would fool with them. He said, I put them under my bed. Oh, my God. Sure enough, he went. I said, well, you don't need prayer. Just go home and get a hammer. And he took it out. That was the end of that. These things are real people. If in doubt, cast it out. That's a good rule of thumb to go by. Amen? This has been...